So welcome to yet another question answering video on the topic of the physical properties of sound. So let's see if we can tackle some questions from past papers and uh, see how well we have an insight to this, to this subject. And what I'd like you to do, as always, I'd like you to pause this video and try and work on these questions on your own. So pause this video now. Very good. Let's get started. And let's break those apart. I find it easier that way. Sound requires a medium for propagation. And right away, this should make sense to you because sound is not like an electromagnetic wave. It can travel through space or through a vacuum. So this would be true right off the bat. And sound is an electromagnetic wave. And this, this really is total opposite, really. Light is an electromagnetic wave. Sound is a mechanical wave. So this should be false. Hopefully, this makes sense to you. In gases and liquids, sound travels as transverse. And what really they mean here is that sound can either show us a transverse wave, transverse or transversal, doesn't really matter, or longitudinal. And this really, really has a lot to do with the medium that it travels through. And longitudinal would usually, would usually see through gases and liquids, gases and liquids. And in denser material, usually solids or uh, liquid, liquid surface, surface of liquids due to surface tension, we would see it maybe as transverse. So we know, based on this information, that this statement is, is incorrect. Because sound traveling through gases and liquids will show us a longitudinal wave. Very good. Humans can hear sounds up to 16 megahertz. And depends if you're looking at the minimals or maybe you're looking at the lecture slides. You would see that the range, the acoustic range, is from around 16 to 20 hertz to about 16 to 20 kilohertz. And that means 16 megahertz is insanely well into the ultrasound, maybe even the hypersound range, because ultrasound basically, uh, at least for imaging purposes, could start at, at 2 megahertz and could vary up to maybe 10 megahertz. So 16 megahertz is a ludicrous, is really a ludicrous range. So this would be incorrect. <clears throat> Very good. So we're going to move on. Let's do yellow. An observer will always hear a greater intensity of sound for an approaching source than one that is moving away. I'm just going to take this statement. And really, we know from the Doppler effect that if there's a, an object that is moving, and maybe there's an observer here, an observer here, there's going to be some sort of, of shift in the sound properties. But we need to consider what sort of shift is this. Is this a shift of intensity? No, it is not. It is a shift in frequency. It is a shift in frequency. And really, that's, that's how they like to mess around with you, because they're because if you, if you read this, it will make sense. There's some sort of change or some sort of shift in a property of sound. So maybe it's in density. That is incorrect. It is frequency. It is frequency. So this would render this whole sentence, this whole statement false. Because the Doppler effect is the change of sound intensity due to a relative motion between source and observer. And just based on what I told you, you know this is also false. But if you read this whole thing as a whole, maybe it will make sense to you. Maybe you're saying, yeah, there's some sort of, there's some sort of, sh of shift in, some, in, in a property, maybe because the Doppler effect is due to relative motion, but really break them apart. And they really like to, to switch around intensity and frequency as far as maybe mixing you mixing around. Very good. So hopefully we were able to avoid that. And we're going to move on to some fill in the blanks and true or false. And I, and I strongly suggest you pause this video, pause this video and try and work on it on your own. Do both. Do both. All right. Perfect. Let's get started. By multiplying the wavelength with blank, the speed of sound can be calculated. And really, this pertains to this equation right here. And this is just something that you need to know. I can't really help you get an intuition behind it because this is just physical. But if we multiply the wavelength with the frequency, we would get the speed of sound. And really, <clears throat> And really, this, this was actually represented in one of the finals. They asked the students to calculate it. This is a pretty easy calculation. But you need to know this formula in order to do that. Multiplying the wavelength with the frequency. frequency. Very good. Blank is the medium's resistance to bringing its particles into motion. And this is just uh, this talking about the characteristics of every material. And every material can resist, can resist some sort of a wave passing through it. And this is called acoustic impedance. Acoustic impedance. Hopefully you remember this. Very good. And every material has its own acoustic impedance. 
generating an ultrasound is possible using the blank effect. And really there are three things that you can put in here. You can put here in here either inverse piezoelectric, magnetostriction, or electrostriction. And really it depends on the word bank that you have, but usually there usually I would say that would give you the inverse inverse piezoelectric inverse piezoelectric effect. And maybe in the word bank you'd have both the inverse and the regular piezoelectric effect. And often students mix those up. So inverse piezoelectric effect takes current, gives me um, a vibration or a sound. And the only, the piezoelectric effect without the inverse, without the inverse, would take a sound wave, would take a vibration and, and give me current. And that way maybe I can interpret a sound wave. Very good. In solids and on the surface of liquids, sound can be observed to show a something wave. And we already discussed this because we're talking about uh, solids and surface of liquids. The, the sound can show us a transverse, transverse or transversal wave. Transversal wave. Very good. So let's get ahead with the true or false, and hopefully you've already done those as well, or at least tried. Ultrasound can be used for both imaging and therapeutic purposes. And this should be this should be uh, an easy get around because you know that you can you can blast kidney stones and you know that maybe you can you can image uh, you can image an infant. So this this is just based on maybe maybe intuition even. You can say yeah, it makes sense to me and it does. Very good. And in the presentation you can see uh, you can see examples for both. Very good. The speed of sound depends on the properties of the medium. And we already know here that it, it depends on the frequency and, and, and uh, wavelength. And often students say, I remember this, and there's no properties of the medium here. So sound must be independent of the properties of the medium. But really, the speed of sound is very much dependent on the, on the density and compressibility, or you can call them the, uh, the rho and the kappa. The rho and kappa, usually I just say P and K, although it is incorrect, it is rho and kappa because I just like to keep it simple. But you can see that the density and the compressibility do pertain in a great way, in a very great way to the speed of sound. So saying that the speed of sound depends on the properties of the medium is definitely true. Is definitely true. Very good. <clears throat> the more a medium is compressible, the more a medium is compressible, the more the speed of sound will slow down. Well, let's see what this means. Just based on this, we can see if, if the compressibility, the kappa, goes up, the speed of sound would go down. There, there's an inverse relationship here that should, should be apparent to you. So yes, this is true. And that is why maybe, and not maybe, <laughs> that is why in air, the uh, speed of sound is considerably slower, right around 333 point something meters per second. So the more a medium is compressible, the more the speed of sound will slow down while going through it. This is true. Let's see if we have a false one here. Reflection and refraction will occur when an ultrasound beam passes through the boundaries of two materials having two different, two different acoustic impedances. And really, this should make sense to you because we already mentioned it on uh, and, and numerous occasions that if you have some sort of two materials, material A and material B, and they have two different acoustic impedances, two different acoustic impedances. We, we're going to have a border here of two different acoustic impedances. And at that border, we're going to view reflection and refraction. At that border, this is where we're going to see if we have an incoming, an incoming speed, uh, an incoming sound wave. We're going to see some re reflection, and we're going to also see some refraction. So this only happens in the border of, of, of uh, two acoustic impedances. If the material would have, let's just say we have an A and B material, and theoretically they have the same acoustic impedance, sound is not really going to be showing us reflection and refraction, theoretically. Perfect. So hopefully this made a little bit of sense to you, and hopefully you were able to at least resolve, and if not, understand the answer to these questions. And uh, we'll see you in the next video.